from Kona to Yanan, the political memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi, Chapter Eight, Military Service, 1942. When the sugar beet topping season was about over, I was invited to the National Conference of the Japanese American Citizens League in Salt Lake City. I was informed by the League's officers that delegates would come from the various relocation centers where 110,000 people of Japanese ancestry were detained. I was asked to lead the discussion on agricultural furlough work on the basis of our Idaho experience. During the week-long convention at Salt Lake City, Carl Yonda wired me from Man Center that an army recruiter was in our camp. He urged me to return immediately if I wanted to volunteer for intelligence service. During lunch hour, Tico and I discussed the telegram. Half an hour later we were packed and down at the bus station, headed for Idaho. In Idaho, we could not obtain travel permits to enter the Western Defense Command so we backtracked to Salt Lake City. From there we traveled with four delegates of the JACL and arrived at Reno at midnight. A woman at the station, who evidently was poisoned by propaganda of the Hearst type, called the police upon seeing us. When the policemen arrived, they asked us a few questions, took us to the station, and held us overnight. It seemed ironic that we would be detained when we were rushing back to get in the service. We had violated the curfew order for citizens of Japanese ancestry and enemy aliens. Tiko sat up all night, watching the four JACL delegates play poker. I slept on the floor beside a drunken sailor. Tiko remarked that the poor fellow might go crazy if he woke up and suddenly found he had been captured by Japs who had taken over Reno, the city for quick divorces, gambling joints, and playing poker, even in jail. Back in Manzaner, I learned that the military intelligence service wanted Japanese language specialists. I was afraid I would not pass the examination, for early in childhood after a few years of study I had completely neglected my Japanese. I remembered how mother constantly encouraged us to study Japanese, saying the Caucasian-owned firms would never employ us unless we knew the language, for they would prefer white employees to deal with English-speaking customers. I remembered the trips mother made down the slope of Mauna Loa, over the narrow trail in the coffee fields of South Kona, to the Napohopoho Japanese school to arrange with its principal to have him tutor us at night. Mother had a high regard for this man, who had come to teach us in Kona after serving a prison sentence with other Japanese aliens. They were all leaders of the Japanese workers' sugar strike of 1920, thrown in jail by Hawaii's big employers in order to crush the strike for higher wages and better conditions. In late November 1942, the response to military intelligence recruitment was poor. Therefore, the recruiters scraped the bottom of the barrel and passed those like us with low Japanese language qualifications. On December 2, 1942, 14 volunteers left Manzaner, just 14 from a camp of 10,000. This was certainly a reflection of the poor administration at Manzaner, where no educational program was instituted to give evacuees perspective and understanding in the struggle for their constitutional rights in a nation with democratic traditions. There was a great deal of bitterness which was to break out in a riot a few days after our departure. It was a cold morning, with just a handful of people at the exit gate to see us off. This was not a time for fanfare. Volunteering was then not a popular thing to do. The small pro-Japanese militarist group which was to lead the riot looked upon us as traitors, and some of us had been cautioned not to volunteer. I said goodbye to Tiko inside the barbed wire enclosure because she could not step outside. Only a few days before, we were both free, rushing back to camp so that I could volunteer for military service. As we drove away, we saw the handful of people who had come to see us off, waving from inside the desert city of exiles which was full of bitterness and charged like dynamite. The news of the bloody riot which exploded in Manzaner on the eve of the first Pearl Harbor anniversary, December 7, 1942, reached us at Fort Snelling, Minnesota. I read a long account in the Minneapolis Star Journal. Fred Tayama, who had returned to Man Center with me from Salt Lake City only a few days before, had been beaten up. Military guards had moved into the concentration camp and bursts of machine gun fire had caused casualties among evacuees. The few extremists among the small number of pro-Japanese militarists, who capitalized on the Caucasian administration's bungling and bullying in camp and upon the raw bitterness of the uprooted people, had been removed from Man Center. On the other hand, those who had spoken out against Japanese militarism and fascism and or for the America of democratic traditions were also removed. A few days later, I received a letter from my wife, Tiko, and I was surprised to learn that she had remained in Manzaner. She wrote that in midday a masked gang had broken into Tayama's barracks room and attacked him with clubs. His daughter, who was alone with him at the time, yelled for help and finally scared the men away. Shortly thereafter, the pro-militarist leaders mobilized a gang which they led to ransack the hospital in search of Tayama. They combed the hospital, but a doctor had hidden Tayama skillfully. When I met Tayama months later he said the mob brushed past his hiding place. An armored ambulance from the nearby military police camp rushed into Manzaner to pick up Tayama. 
He was a victim of the pre-evacuation rumors that the leaders of the Japanese American Citizens League had been instrumental in bringing about the evacuation. Nothing was further from the truth, but in the hysteria-filled atmosphere and mass suffering and injustice, men like Teyama became scapegoats. The white racists' invested interests on the outside that caused our exile had actually won the day. Kiko's letter said that when one of the top pro-militarist leaders was picked up by the police, his colleague led a mob to the police station and demanding the former's release. Numerous evacuees tagged along to observe the demonstration. The military guards fired into the mob, killing a Nisei and wounding others. Another Nisei died in the hospital. The mob pushed toward the administration building to take down the stars and stripes. At that moment, Nisei Boy Scouts gathered around the flagpole and challenged the angry demonstrators. The mob was stunned, lost momentum, and gradually moved away. Man's inner after the riot is like a camp of the dead, Tico's letter said. Almost no one saunters out and the streets are practically empty. Some people are mourning the dead, some are wondering what had happened. The great majority had not taken part in the riot. They are remorseful and bitter that this has happened and has brought a mantle of sorrow and shame to the community. She wrote she was glad that I had left, for on the night of the riot a mass meeting was held in our block, where most of the pro-militarist ringleaders lived. A speaker shouted get so and so, and Tico heard my name mentioned. She ran into the barracks and locked the door. I felt strongly that Tico should leave the camp but she had nowhere to go. She informed me that we were going to have a child. From Fort Snelling I moved to nearby Camp Savage which was a military intelligence service language school. Practically all the students were Japanese Americans being trained for duty in the Pacific and Asiatic War theaters. We had Hawaiian-born Nisei who had volunteered for intelligence service from the 100th Infantry Battalion which was then stationed at Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. After the War Department had decided to use Nisei ground troops in Europe against Germans and Italians rather than against Japanese, the unit was shipped to the mainland. The men waited around, performed repeated maneuvers and months slipped by. Some doubted they would be sent overseas, those at Camp Savage told us, so they had volunteered for intelligence service. At Camp Savage, I saw the difference between Nisei brought up in different environments. For example, the Hawaiian Nisei would not stand Jap baiting. Shortly after they arrived at Camp Savage, some of the cocky and prejudiced white defense workers who had been calling the mainland Nisei names without comeback in the restaurants in the town of Savage were forced to change their manners. One of the Hawaiian Nisei spoke with his fists, and they were surprisingly eloquent and convincing to the defense workers. After that, they respected all Nisei. We heard stories that the Hawaiian Nisei at Camp McCoy occasionally tangled with Texans who had a grudge against them because the Japanese troops had captured or killed Texans at Corregidor and Baton. The Hawaiians showed the Texans through the hard way that they too were Americans in uniform. On the other hand, the West Coast Nisei were generally less aggressive and outspoken and would not throw their fists when the white men called them dirty Japs. They had a reserve about them which I felt was basically akin to the attitude of the Negroes in the Deep South who are conditioned by pressure, intimidation, and brutality of the white supremacists to know their place. Unlike the Hawaiian Nisei, who had enjoyed more freedom, they had been discriminated against and oppressed on the West Coast to a far greater extent. Comparatively, the Hawaiian Nisei were more like Negroes in the northern states. The mainland Nisei, particularly their leaders, struggle through political action for equality under the Constitution. They have become, during MD after the war, better organized and more experienced to fight against discrimination and are spearheading the fight for naturalization rights for ill aliens now barred by the government. Among the Hawaiian Nisei, such concerted struggle is absent. At Camp Savage, we studied Japanese from 7 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon, with an hour's break at noon. Classroom competition was intense and the study load heavy. After supper we studied from 7 until 9, but the classrooms did not empty until the lights went out at 11. Quite a number of us went to the latrine after this and spent another hour or two with books wide open on our laps, sitting on toilet bowls. When inspecting officers made their rounds, we pretended the books were incidental and that we were there for legitimate reasons. I had a friend who studied in his bunk after lights went out. Under cover of his blanket, he used a flashlight. Almost every student took his studies with deep seriousness. We realized that a useful intelligence operator would be one who could interrogate Japanese prisoners or translate captured documents all by himself. For those with little language background the going was rugged. I believe I spent more time than any student at Camp Savage on studies during our six-month term. For this diligence the student body voted at the end of the term that I had made the most progress and I won a prize. I believed in the war and that made me apply myself to the utmost in my studies. A few elderly white officers studied with us. These were repatriates from Japan who had returned aboard the Gripshaw. The commandant of Camp Savage had taken them into the army immediately and made them majors and captains. Their aptitude for Japanese was far from impressive to deplorable, considering they had lived in Japan 10 to 15 years. 
For example, when students were reshuffled after the first six weeks, a major was demoted five grades and a captain two grades. These white officers were to supervise us when we were assigned to duty after graduation. Usually ten Nisei constituted a team, with a white officer leading it. As time went on, white students who had studied six months of Japanese at the University of Michigan came to Camp Savage. They were called cadets, and after the short period of training at the camp, they were to become officers. Nisei who studied with them, in the same classrooms, under the same instructors, and who covered the same subjects, were to be assigned under them and were not made officers the same as the white cadets upon graduation. The cadets were concentrated in lower classes since their knowledge of Japanese was limited. They lived in new and better barracks and ate in the officers' mess. This was segregation along the color line and it was Jim Crow extended to another American minority. It was a slice of the ugly bigotry and prejudice that bars Negroes from schools attended by whites in the South. That limits students of Asian and Jewish ancestries from professional training in our universities and discriminates more harshly against Negroes in the same fields of endeavor. I felt that these young men trained for the officer cast at Camp Savage because of color would have preferred to be with us and among us. Their freedom was restricted for they had no chance to compete with us equally and stand on their merits. Some of them who were less gifted became the butt of Nisei jokes. You would hear remarks Marks like, look at that officer material. In both a limited and a broader sense, when one people is discriminated against or oppressed, there is no freedom even for the privileged. Thus it was at Camp Savage, where the whole school depended on Nisei language specialists. Thus it was at military camps where I saw Negro soldiers segregated in barracks areas, in recreation, and even in military assignment. They were fighting the same foreign enemy as the others, and more intensely, for democratic rights at home to give full meaning to the Constitution. In late January, the War Department announced it would activate a special combat team of Japanese Americans. In the barracks, the Nisei debated whether this was a forward step. It was, by the sheer fact that mass enlistment was reinstituted, but why the segregation? Why not throw open all the services to Japanese Americans, the Navy and the Marines included? Some argued that a separate unit would afford the Nisei a better chance to prove their loyalty more conclusively. President Franklin D. Roosevelt whose speeches agitated the colonial and semi-colonial people in faraway lands to strive for liberation from foreign imperialism and oppressive landlords at home, and made them look to the United States as a nation which was on their side because our country had the proud democratic tradition of the spirit of 1776, said as he approved the War Department proposal for a Nisei combat unit. Americanism is a matter of the mind and heart. Americanism is not, and never was, a matter of race or ancestry. As expected, the professional anti-Oriental racists on the West Coast immediately protested this forward step. Nothing would please them more than Nisei ignominy, and public officials of the Jim Crow South joined in the attempt to sabotage the plan. Representative Johnny Rankin of Mississippi, well known for his services on the House Un-American Activities Committee, advocated in Congress our deportation after the war, with the government purchasing our property. In the meantime, he wanted us to be used in labor battalions. Like Sen, Albert B. Chandler of Kentucky, he said the South would ally with the West Coast on white racial ties to combat the Japanese-American menace. The racists lost a round. In Hawaii, 10,000 volunteers answered the call for 2,500 Japanese Americans. Response from the 10 relocation centers was not as impressive. In order to take a deep sounding of this poor response, it requires a sympathetic understanding of the hardships, sorrow, and bitterness of the evacuees. And to further rub salt into the wound, the government passed out questionnaires in camps during the recruitment to be answered by all aliens and citizens over 17 years of age. Question number 28 asked, Will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government, power or organization? The alien Japanese, whom discriminatory U.S. laws bar from naturalization, could not answer in the affirmative. They would be people without a country if they forswore allegiance to Japan. America was not offering them an alternative of citizenship. After the war, Japan would remain. She was their country. What mattered was that Japan should be democratic and no longer militaristic. And in this country, the aliens should be given the right to naturalization. But this is still being fought for by certain Asian and Pacific peoples today. In the late fall of 1943, almost a year after my enlistment into the army, I received a sudden notice for overseas assignment. The Office of War Information, OWI, had requested the Army Intelligence Training School at Camp Savage for a 10-man combat psychological warfare team. I was put in charge of this team of writers, newspapermen, and artists, translators, and interrogators. I was told by the commandant of the school that this was entirely a new task for graduates of the school, 
He asked us to prepare a leaflet to be shown to the OWI and government officials who were considered experts in this line, reportedly well versed in Japanese psychology. This we did, and we were told our product was satisfactory. We did not realize then the complexities of the war of nerves, because most of us had been raised by parents who spoke Japanese and because we were familiar with Japanese customs and mores. We thought we knew the Japanese soldiers' minds and could understand their behavior. Five members of my team had gone to Japan in their childhood and had lived and studied there for years. One was a graduate of Waste University. Another had been jailed in Japan during his youth because he had participated in the organizing of printers. We were to discover that our knowledge of Japanese militarism was shallow and that the Japanese prisoners of war were about the best study material for us. Their minds were brutalized to hate and fear all white men, to worship the emperor, to fear any unorthodox views not conforming with emperor worship and the views of the Japanese militarists, to sacrifice their lives for the emperor whose wishes were Asia for the Asiatics and Greater East Asia Co prosperity sphere. In 1943, when we were assigned to psychological warfare tasks, Washington was full of experts on Japan who had built and supported myths that the Japanese militarists and the people were incomprehensible, unpredictable, fanatic, treacherous, and so on. There was an extreme type of specialist who even tried to prove that the Japanese were unknowable. We felt that the psychology and behavior of the Japanese militarists were understandable. We were happy that we did not receive briefing from the OWI's Japan experts. The attitudes of these experts were slices of Hollywood movies that pictured the Orient as exotic, mysterious, and even eerie. People are people everywhere, they are peasants, workers, landlords, employers, intellectuals, etc. With my team I moved to California. I wanted to see Tico and Linda, our four-month-old daughter who was born behind barbed wire. We obtained four-day passes at the staging area. I went to Los Angeles, and as I walked the streets I swelled with exuberant triumph. I was back again on this coastal strip from which we had been banished months before. I kept reminding myself about this. Never mind if this stay was temporary. Never mind if I had to come back in army uniform. I was back just the same. And this was made possible by the people of Japanese ancestry on the mainland and in Hawaii fighting for their constitutional rights, fighting against imperialism abroad. All this with democratic-minded Americans of other ethnic and national stock. From deep curiosity, I went to the former Little Tokyo and saw Negro families living there. They had come from the South, tearing themselves loose from farm tenancy and servile tasks to seek wage labor in war plants. I enjoyed talking to them and went into restaurants where Negroes largely congregated. Deep within me I felt that they had open minds and hearts, because they have suffered much more than we have through man's inhumanity to man. I thought how Negroes must feel all the time, or the Jews. There is no peace of mind or feeling of freedom for the persecuted. I felt that the propaganda against us before, during and after the evacuation had deeply poisoned the minds of the white people generally, because there were almost no people of Japanese ancestry on the coast except Nisei in uniform passing through for overseas duty, we stood out quite conspicuously. I felt this, and at that moment an invitation by a Jewish family to make ourselves at home was a moment some of us would not forget. One of the team members was married to the daughter of the family. There were white people, friendly people, there as guests. This was at a time when it was still unpopular for the whites on the west coast to befriend people of Japanese ancestry. I took a bus at Los Angeles for Manzaner. I was going home, I said to myself. Home was Manzaner, where Tico and Linda lived in a tar-papered barracks. Home was behind barbed wire and watch towers. The bus stopped to pick up a man in soiled clothing. The bus operator called him Oki and behaved insultingly toward him. The white man said nothing, and later on, as the seat beside me became vacant, he sat there. I tried to talk to him and he opened up slowly. He had come from the Dust Bowl area of Oklahoma and he was now a migratory laborer. How terrible, I thought, that this white man can be so easily identified as an Oki years after his migration from the Dust Bowl. He was, in a way, like the poor whites of the South. In many ways he was like us and the Negroes, only he was discriminated against, not by color, but by harsh economic stratification. He traveled the wide belt road which Mrs. Ira S. Caldwell, author Erskine Caldwell's mother, described to me as the tobacco road, the poor people's road that crosses international lines. I had traveled that road too, particularly in Kona, Hawaii, and now I was heading for Asia, where no one can escape the harsh impact of tobacco road conditions. And I wondered what were the solutions to all this. A man in GI uniform, walking through the Man Center Relocation Center in the winter of 1943, presented a strange sight. And so it must have been with me as I got off the bus at the gate, walked through the opening in the barbed wire fence, and headed through the sandy fire breaks between rows of tar paper barracks for my home. 
I remember the quiet evening and the feeling of emptiness which I experienced. Many of the youth had left the camp for employment or education in the Midwest and East. Some had volunteered for the army. Still others, frustrated and bitter because of the evacuation, were waiting to be segregated by the government and sent to a camp at Chile Lake in Northern California. It was understandable for aliens to choose segregation, but a considerable number of young men and women over 17 had renounced their citizenship. There were others too young to decide for themselves, who were also affected because their parents turned their faces away from the America of the anti-Oriental racists and press and the economic vultures of the West Coast who grabbed the properties of various evacuees. I had a few days furlough to spend with my family before going overseas. It being supper time when I arrived, I headed for the familiar mess hall of Block 22 and as I had expected, my wife Tico was there. We rushed back to the barracks room where our four-month-old child kicked and played in a makeshift crib. I remember the long discussions we had during my furlough. Someday we would tell our daughter of this home in a concentration camp and in America of democratic traditions. We hoped for better conditions, for the return of sanity through struggles of freedom-loving peoples. Being born an Oriental in a nation with lashing waves and an undertow of racism meant the starting of life with several counts against her. Also, the fact that her birthplace was Man's Inner Relocation Center gave us disturbing thoughts. There are times in a person's life when a great and rapid change takes place in him. Such a moment was my visit to Manzaner. When I saw my child in that tar-papered barracks, I yearned for a future which would be her friend. Such a future must be a peaceful one, no more an era when man must choose between war or depression, or when a large segment of mankind lives in poverty while government subsidy buys surplus food to be stored in caves, and, or destruction of man's worldly goods goes on in order to keep prices high and to guarantee profits for the few. Is it a good and efficient system that operates best when it produces for destruction? either by plowing under when many people starve, or by killing and maiming millions in war. This gives neither security nor peace. It breeds fear, hatred, oppression, and wanton death. While spending my furlough at Manzaner, I visited with old friends. An old man whose son studied with me at Camp Savage came by to ask me about the military intelligence school. I told him his son had become a sergeant and was already on his way to some Pacific island. I am going to Chile Lake Camp for Segregies, he said. He wanted to be repatriated to Japan so that he could live with his youngest daughter. I must look after her. My son is a soldier and he will take care of himself. Did you discuss this matter with him? I asked. He will understand. I've been father and mother to both and now I must look after my youngest, he explained. This was a tragic situation, a son in the U.S., army and his father planning to be repatriated to the enemy country. The man was speaking as a parent, with deep emotion, and I understood his feelings. One cold morning, I walked with Tico to the gate. I was leaving Manzaner for the last time. As we waited for a bus, Ralph Merritt, the well-liked project director, drove up to the gate. How unfortunate, I thought, that he had not been assigned to Manzaner from the beginning, instead of a director who had been manager of an Indian reservation, a man with no deep feeling for the oppressed and the downtrodden. A truck came by with young boys. Merritt gathered them together and lectured them for their previous day's conduct. The day before, this youth work gang had been cleaning the roadside by an adjacent military police camp. The boys had ridiculed and laughed at Manzaner's sentries, who were being given close order drill. An officer had complained to Merritt. The director told the boys he could not let them work on the public highway outside the camp. The gang listened silently, then moved off to work. We saw this as a clear manifestation of inarticulate protest and rebellion against evacuation and detention. A year and a half ago, most of them were too young to perceive the full meaning of Manzaner. Today, they were nurturing resentment. Why couldn't our country rejuvenate them, instill new faith in the democratic traditions of Jefferson, Tom Paine, and Lincoln? They would then participate in the broad struggle for democratic rights, coherently and in an organized manner, thus more effectively. In post-war America, or Japan, a poisoned mind of this sort would not help the cause of democracy. This is clearly evident in Japan today where the former soldiers who were drilled with the militarist philosophy and not re-educated since VJ Day have become the strong core of resurgent gumbatsu. During this period, the West Coast press still howled at us like starved wolves. One day it wanted segregation of the loyal and disloyal in the camps. This was good propaganda to point out that Japs could not be trusted, but when the government set the process of segregation in motion, a howl rose against that program too, for it might easily lead to the return to the West Coast of those cleared in the screening. The atmosphere was no different from that prevailing today, only the hysteria and fear are much more widespread. Then, it was Japanese aliens and Japanese Americans who faced the vicious attacks. Today, the attack is against the militant, organized and vocal left which criticizes the harmful, wasteful and dangerous war program, the striking down of civil rights and official graft and corruption, 
the communists are the first targets as in nazi germany fascist italy or zebatsu japan and as happened in these countries the repression soon extends to progressives liberals and trade unions we finally won to a considerable extent our struggle against the anti-oriental elements and this is history there are people who time and time again say that this could only happen in a democracy like the united states such thinking is so commonly expounded that people actually take it at its face value in times like this it is dangerous thinking for from it flows the disarming assurance that some day despite how bad repression is today conditions will improve automatically the mere fact that such violations of constitutional rights as those perpetuated against us took place in a nation with democratic traditions show up the limitations of our democracy fortunately democratic-minded white people were able to speak out on the west coast and they fought side by side with us while they were lashed as jap lovers at this stage how can one say that some day all the repression will pass by without the freedom of the press which means the right to read without the freedom to assemble and to discuss without the freedom to think and advocate to lead or to follow and support causes and ideas democratic rights cannot be won or preserved man's inner itself is but a memory today it is a symbol of prejudice of shameful and dangerous hysteria but now camps like Manzinner are going up again. Manzinner and nine other camps for Japanese aliens and Japanese Americans set a precedent. The Justice Department announced January 1, 1952, that about 3,000 communists would be put behind barbed wire. But months before, President Truman had asked for about 60,000 to 70,000 guards for the new concentration camps. How many hundreds of thousands of people is the administration contemplating on concentrating to be watched by so many guards? There are reportedly about 50,000 communists in this country. Who will be the others? Will the red-baiting hysteria pay off, or will decent and democratic-minded Americans win freedom struggle? To remain silent at a time like this, a time of festering fascism, of the corrupt and graft-ridden era of government, means only this, that the silent and the cowardly are not preparing a friendly future for our sons and daughters and for coming generations. 